just a second. Thanks, James and Julie. Please, Lord Jesus. I'm going to pray over it. Ah. Ah. <laughs> it's literally worked the past nine weeks, right? It, I think it helps to blow it, blow it, so it healed. Yes. Stick, it, stick your pen out like Michael Jordan did. Uh, oh, have you been watching that documentary? No, I think it helps to blow it, blow it, so it healed. Yes. Stick your pen out like Michael Jordan did. Hi, everybody. I think it helps to blow it, blow it, so it healed. Yes. Okay. Are we good to go? Hi, everybody. Uh, we're sorry for the delay. We were just getting all set up. We are actually on the Denver Seminary campus and are keeping six feet apart and following social distance, but wanted to be able to meet with you from our campus that many of us have not even been on for the last couple months. And as you can see, you know, I'm wearing my scarf. Our lives have changed significantly. And yet we have done this together and uh, we have made it to the end of the semester. And so we just hope that this is a time to really mark the significant change that we've walked through as a community, to hear from our leaders, to spend time in worship as we close out this semester. So before I open our time in prayer, let me just introduce to you a little bit of the flow of the day. We're gonna be able to hear from Sharon Geip as well as Dr. Mark Young. And right after I pray, we're going to be led in worship by James Butler and Julie Butler. They're both part of InterVarsity. James serves as the Associate Area Director, Ministry Director for the Central Rockies area. And Julia is the Area Intercessor for the Central Rockies area. So we're just glad that they can join us and lead us in worship. So as we start, let me just open our time in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence with us, for your care for us through your spirit over these last months. And in all that each of us have faced in this time of quarantine, time of change, time of loss, time of disruption, we just declare your stability and your uh, regularity in our lives, that even if we're distant from one another, you are not distant from us. And we thank you for the many ways that you have provided through your people, through your church, and through your spirit's presence with us. And so we just commit this time to you and we thank you that we have opportunity to worship together at the end of this semester. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me just pass it off to James and Julie. Thank you. Hello. It's good to be with you. Um, and uh, we are definitely in a, in a time where, um, where the life is different for everyone. Everyone in the world, life is different. And, uh, and there will be another time, uh, the Bible tells us, where life will be different. Um, when Jesus comes through and he uh, transforms um, everything and makes everything new again. And the Bible says that every uh, every language, tongue, tribe, in the same way that every tongue, tribe, and nation have been messed with by COVID, uh, one day they will be messed with by him. And, uh, and the Bible says that everybody will, uh, will be bowed before the throne and confessing together uh, that Jesus is Lord. And so um, as, we, as we celebrate uh, that reality that one day, uh, once again, we will be uh, in a new, uh, a new time and a new place, um, I want to invite us to sing, uh, sing all the glory and all the honor and all the power um, be unto the King. Al que está 
que estás al que está sentado en el trono al que vive para siempre y siempre sea la gloria sea la honra y el poder sea la gloria sea la honra y el poder to the one to the one who sits on the Thank you, God, that you see us in the circumstances that we are in. You know us intimately and deeply. You know our needs. You are present with us. You walk with us. You lead us in this season in this unprecedented time. And we thank you, God, that you know us and you see us and you walk with us. And you lift us up, Father God. You lead the way. And so we look to you now, no matter what our circumstances are, trust.
What a wonderful reminder that no matter where you are, you're sitting in your living room or wherever you are watching this, that God knows who you are and he knows exactly what your situation is and he knows your name. What a comfort that is. Um, I was asked to share a little reflection on my time here at the seminary because my time is coming to a close soon. I will be leaving the seminary in early June. Um, and I've been here for 13 years. So this has been an amazing place for me to be. And um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my journey while I've been at the seminary and also just talk a little bit about how strange it is uh, to be leaving at a time where we are mostly not even on campus. And I know that that has got to be strange for all of you as well. So um, let me just tell you that when I first started at the seminary, um, I came to the position out of a place of, of kind of pain in my life. I, um, I had been working at another institution and had felt that place of it's time to go. And yet I didn't feel like God had said it was time to go. And I felt like he was asking me to wait on him. And um, I had many conversations with him about this. And one morning on my way to work, I was uh, praying and actually crying and asking God and telling him that I didn't think I could do my other position for much longer. And I felt in my spirit, like he said, okay, you can go. And I thought, what? <laughs> Did it, was that really the voice of the Lord or is that just my will? And, um, but I sensed a real sense of peace that he was, he was in this decision. And later that day I got on uh, Denver Seminary's website because it was a place I had often over the years wanted to work. And lo and behold, my position was posted that day. And um, so I know that the wait place that God put me in was just because he wasn't ready my new position wasn't ready for me yet. And he had a very special thing for me in being here. So my beginning of my time was really a time of healing. And um, I have the best team of people in the counseling division to work with. And um, they came around me and encouraged me and supported me and loved me in a way that I don't know if I've ever had that experience in a job before. And um, the other beautiful part was that I got to do the things that I just really love. And that is spending time with students, spending time with faculty, um, but the students are really my joy and my passion. And um, so I got to be in a space where I got to interact with all of you and um, walk with you on your journeys and pray with you, pray for you, get to know you and love you. And um, that's just been an amazing thing for me. I think one of the things that um, God really placed on my heart was that um, my space should be a space where people felt safe and that felt his presence. So my constant prayer as I've been in my job is, Lord, would you just be present here? And when people come into my space, Lord, would they see you? And I just think that that is one of the reasons he has blessed me so greatly in relationship with all of you. Um, the other reason I think is because I have never actually gotten the joy of having children myself. And when I found out that I wasn't going to be able to have children, God gave me a scripture in Isaiah 54 about um, uh, greater the number of children for the barren woman than of her who gave birth and to expand your tents. And I took that literally and I said, Lord, okay, if, um, if I'm not gonna be able to have children, then let me be a blessing to as many people as possible. And he has just brought people over and over. Some of the students, some of you, I've only been able to maybe have one or two times with of advising and others of you have come and shared your life with me. And that means more than you will ever know. Um, I think about all of you as you're getting ready to graduate and how um, anticlimactic 
it is probably for those graduating students who um, will not have a time of celebration like is normal. And it reminds me of when I graduated with my master's degree. And I graduated in a semester where there was no graduation ceremony. And uh, I, I remember going in um, to the school and turning in my last papers and having this sense of accomplishment and freedom and then walking out to the parking lot and felt like, oh, shouldn't there be a band playing or something? Because this needs to be celebrated, you know? And there was no celebration. And I did get to do a graduation ceremony uh, about six months later, but I had already moved on in my life. And um, that celebration though is very important. I think that as you think about your own lives that you need to figure out a way to celebrate this accomplishment in your lives, whatever that might be, because what God has done in you and what you have accomplished is so worth celebrating. And so I can totally relate to you and how that feels right now, but know that God is with you. I would say for some of you, this may be a very dark time. And I wanted to tell you that um, one of the things my mother told me when I was going through a dark time in my life, she said to me, don't forget in the dark what you know to be true in the light. Don't forget in the dark what you know to be true in the light. And that has stuck with me through all of my years of knowing that God is my savior. He cares for me. He knows my name. He knows the plans he has for me. And I can trust that even when things don't seem to make sense. So I just wanna encourage you today to um, continue to look to him uh, to fill those places in your life. I'd also say, look to the Psalms. I think a lot of us are looking to the Psalms these days. But one of the things I've learned about the Psalms is that a lot of times in the Psalms of lament, there, the psalmist is holding out his hands and saying, have you forgotten me, Lord? And some of you may be in a place where you feel forgotten right now. But this, the psalmist also usually brings in the fact that they remember the goodness of the Lord to God's people. And you need to remember not just what is going on in your life, but what has happened in the lives of the faithful ones who belong to Jesus. And when, you, when things don't make sense to you, I would just encourage you to remember that um, even though it's, it doesn't make sense right now, um, God is faithful to his people. And you can look to your friends and your family as well as those in the Bible of how he has carried us through. So um, as you prepare to celebrate, I pray that you, again, that you do something to really recognize what God has done in you during these years at seminary and get ready for what he has next for you. I know that I am getting ready for what he has next for me. My husband and I are gonna be moving to Arizona and we are also moving with our best friends. So we, um, they're gonna be our neighbors two doors down from us. And we are so excited because uh, we think uh, that neighborhood better get ready because we're gonna share Jesus with them. And we're so excited for what's next. And I'm excited for you. And I just pray God's blessings over you as you go. Um, that's all I have to say. Thanks, Chair. <laughs>
of the earth. And so we just turn to trust all of those shaken places um, to you, Father God. We come and we turn to you to give you all of our shaken places and to say through it all, through the joys, through the challenges, we trust in you. We put our attention, our focus, and our hope in you. And so help us, Father God, to trust you and find you so that you can make well our soul in any place of chaos, any place of sorrow. Make well our souls, Lord. As we look to you, you make well our souls. So we trust you, Jesus. And seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. So through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. be it for me to not believe even when my eyes came to rest in you this mountain that's in front of me
Let me say thank you to those who led us in worship today. Thank you very much. If we were in a room, we'd all clap for you. <laughs> and thank you for your work, for your uh, service. I also want to say thank you to Tessa and to Christy who organized this for us. Uh, this takes a lot of work, a lot of production, a lot of anxiety. Is the technology going to work? And is it going to work at the right time? So I really want to thank you guys for taking the time to do this and putting your effort and your talents together. And to Sharon, you guys still have time to change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love for you to stay with us. I think Sharon has probably known me longer than just about anyone else at Denver Seminary. Uh, she was on the search committee when I was interviewed to come here. And I didn't know a soul at Denver Seminary except one, I mean, Dan and Carol. And so thank you for the journey 11 years together here. I want us to take just a few moments and reflect on the theme that we've been working at this year, working on this year. You have to go back a couple of years to put together a great affirmation of our faith that we've used as thematic elements in the last three years of Denver Seminary's life. That great affirmation, we believe, has over a thousand years of history, and it's very simply like this. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. I say that to myself every day. I say it out loud to myself every day because I need to hear myself say it. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. During this year, we've been focusing on the last of those three affirmations that Christ will come again. And if you've been a part of any of staff meetings or the early chapel sessions that we had, you would know that we are living in an in-between time. Christ will come again implies that all that God has for us isn't yet realized. The world isn't yet all that God created it to be. We're not yet all that God created us to be. We wait for Christ to return and to perfect creation, to perfect redemption, and in that to make us and the world all that he creates us to be. But in the meantime, we wait. We wait with that not yetness of our faith. We know that Christ has died. We know that Christ is risen. We know that we experience the presence of God, the salvation that is ours in him. But yet, not all of it. Perhaps it's not just that it's a not yetness to our faith, but an even moreness to our faith. The redemption that we enjoy will be even more life-giving than the redemption that we have today. So we wait. We wait. It seems to me that we are not the only people on the planet who live with the sense that the world isn't right, isn't yet right. There's a fancy philosophical world word for that. It's called Weltschmerz. It's a German word that basically means the pain of the world. It's that recognition that the world isn't right. It isn't what it ought to be. And so we wait. There's another philosophical term that comes alongside of that, another German one, sein sucht. It means a yearning or a longing for the world to be made right, for that which isn't right to be made right. Or maybe you could say it this way, for what's wrong in the world to be made right and what's broken in the world to be made whole and what's ugly in the world to be made beautiful. We yearn for that, don't we? 
We recognize the world around us and we yearn for the world that Christ has promised us when he returns. And so we wait. The question is, how do we wait? It's fascinating to me to reflect on the fact that this pandemic that we're experiencing is in some almost absurd way, a bit of a microcosm of human history. We're in the midst of a world that isn't what it ought to be, experiencing things that shouldn't be the way that they are. I was saying to someone just recently, it's like we're living in a dream. It's surreal to go to a store and stand outside the store six feet apart wearing a mask. And it's surreal to be here on campus and see people that we love, that we want to be with, that we want to hug, and we're wearing masks and standing six feet apart, doing air hugs and smiling with our eyes. It's surreal. It's not what it's supposed to be. And we wait. What's fascinating is we don't know when the situation we're in with this pandemic will end, just as we don't know when Christ will return. So we wait. The question is, how do we wait? What is it that we're called to as the people of God, as those who are certain that Christ will return and make everything right and whole and beautiful? How do we wait? It's instructive to us, and certainly it was to the disciples when Jesus spent time with them in the upper room. He gave them, I think, three key ideas that they could hang on to that would guide them in this period of waiting that lay before them. And oh, by the way, they were facing a change, a sudden change in their lives, something they couldn't really anticipate that's going to strip out from under them all that's familiar all that they built their lives around. In just a few short days after Jesus talks with them, the life they'd had with Jesus was gone. One day, three years wiped out. So how does he prepare them for that kind of change to enter into a world that they don't know how to navigate? It seems to me he tells them three things. First. He's honest with them about the situation. He doesn't paint it with a rosy screen or a rosy filter. He simply says to them, the world isn't what it ought to be and it's not going to be what it ought to be for some time to come. He's brutally honest with them. In chapter 15, he tells them, if the world has hated me, it will also hate you. Or if the world hates you, it's because they hated me. And so he tells the disciples that they will face opposition, they will face suffering, they will enter into a world that they do not want to enter into. He tells them, I'm going to a place you cannot go. Well, they've been with Jesus. They want to follow Jesus. They want to go where he is going. And so he's honest with them, just as we need to be honest with ourselves until Christ returns we will continue to live with the pain of a world that's still broken. The second thing he tells them, however, is one that gives them the strength to move through this world that isn't what it ought to be. He tells them in, in chapter 16, verse 17, that it is to your advantage that I am going away. I would guess there wasn't a single person in that room that thought it would be to their advantage if Jesus left them. But he goes on to say this, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The advocate, the comforter, the one who walks alongside, the one we know as the Holy Spirit will come as Jesus departs. And this advocate, this one who comes, will then testify to them about the truth about Jesus, will testify to the world the truth about Jesus, will empower them to be who God has called, whom Jesus has called them to be, 
those who testify about him in the world. And the Holy Spirit will be with them throughout that journey in this world that isn't quite right, present with them, giving them what they need to navigate the world that they're in. Then he tells them as well earlier in the chapter that to get through this period of time where they wait, they need to love one another that unity that they have as the followers of Jesus, that common identity, that bond of empathy and compassion and desire for the well-being of the other. That's what will allow them as a community to navigate this world that isn't what it ought to be, to wait until Christ comes. And so it is with us, both in the short term in this pandemic, as well as through the years ahead, before Christ returns, if he tarries. Those three words from Jesus, those three teachings from Jesus, guide us in this time of waiting. Being honest about the world we're in, knowing that the Holy Spirit is with us, empowering us, testifying to the truth about the Son, and loving and depending upon one another as together we walk through. First this pandemic, and then the rest of our lives. My dear brothers and sisters, the spring semester is never an easy semester. I've been institutionalized in schools for a long, long time. And I can say to you that every spring semester is difficult. Throw in a little pandemic, a global health crisis, and it becomes even a little more difficult, doesn't it? We know the world isn't what it ought to be. We're living it out on the short term, and we will live it out on the long term. But Christ has died. In that death, he has victory over sin, death, and evil. Christ is risen, validating that his death accomplished all that, and Christ will come again where he perfects the defeat of sin and death and evil, and the world is set right and made whole and beautiful. That's what we're waiting for. And that's what we're yearning, yearning for. That's the power of hope. May the Lord bless you in the remaining days of this pandemic and for the years ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Young, and thank you, Sharon, for sharing with us and encouraging our hearts in the midst of this waiting time. As we close our time together, uh, Tessa and I wanna revisit actually a uh, liturgy we walked our community through in December for Advent. One that spoke of the chaos, the longing and the waiting that we're in and really crying out to the Lord for him to come and meet us. So there is a leader part, which I'll do. And then I want you to participate, which I know is a little funny on Zoom and follow Tessa's lead and read the part of the people. And you can find it in the link under the video right now. So let's begin. Our world sometimes seems to be in chaos and out of control. We constantly hear of wars, of terrorist acts, of genocide, of the most horrific atrocities, of unspeakable cruelty. Is there no, no justice to be found? Is there no peace? O oh Lord, do not be far away. Come quickly to our aid. Come and be with us. Our nation and our world sometimes seems to be in chaos and out of control. We hear of violence, of racial tension, of crime rates, of social upheaval. We debate policy and politics and wonder what it will take to fix the problems. We wonder if they can be fixed. Is there no righteousness in the land? Who has the answers? Oh God, hear our cries and have mercy on us. Rise up, O oh Lord, come to our help. For the sake of your steadfast love, come and be with us. Sometimes our own lives seem to be in chaos and out of control. We struggle with changing circumstances, we grapple with the consequences of our own choices. 
we reap the bitter harvest of our own sin. Is there any hope for healing? Is there a path to a better future? Oh God, hear our cries and have mercy on us. Oh Lord, come with your forgiving and healing presence. Come be with us. We sometimes think that the future is ours to control. We think that everything depends on us. The right political decisions, the force of our armies, the might of our intelligence and technology, the power of our moral certainty. Yet we sometimes forget about God's future. That future is shaped by his presence and activity in the world on his own terms. Oh God, hear our cries and have mercy on us. Oh Lord, we have not forgotten you. You are our hope. Our trust is in you. Come and be with us. Emmanuel. God's promise has always been, I will be with you. That promise to be with us calls us to hold the present realities of life within the cradle of expectation. The present is not the final chapter. The world that we experience with all of its sin and pain and misery is not God's final word. So we wait expectantly. Days are surely coming. Oh God, come quickly. Yeah, well, it's six feet, six feet. Um, Rob Bachman just told us that the ceiling tiles in here are exactly two feet wide. So if we stay two, four, six, three ceiling tiles away, we're, we're good to go. <laughs> but um, I wish you all could be with us here. And uh, for those of you who are students who are watching, um, it's been Christy and I's joy to, to walk with many of you in these past few months. And we're really eager for those of you who are returning to get to see you hopefully in the fall and um, even over the summer perhaps. So uh, we, we hope you're doing well and trust that you will reach out to us if you're, you have any need. Uh, so as we close, I, I just wanna bless you um, and, and close us in prayer and know that uh, our whole community, uh, we're together through God's spirit and that we share some of the same sorrows and joys um, and uh, we're all equally proud of all of you graduates, so congratulations, and uh, we look forward to celebrating you in August, but also right now. Uh, and if you haven't written to Brian, an alumni, to tell him your t-shirt size, please do so. He can, so he can send you a t-shirt and a journal that we made. That was a surprise, but I let, let I, I'm sorry, I wrote it. All right, well, may God bless you as you finish up your schoolwork. May he fill you with a sense of his presence, renew your motivation, and recenter your studies in his purposes. May you find comfort and be greeted with kindness as you hold the uncertainties of this time, this job market, and this new season. Let me pray. Jesus, we come before you as a learning and worshiping community, united together by your very life. Go with us into these final days of the semester, and as many uh, students are even starting summer classes again, give them a, a fresh sense of um, your presence and your love, uh, and, and God, I ask on their behalf that you renew their understanding and their vision for the future that you have for them, and that they know that you're caught, they're, they are caught up in your story and they do not walk alone. May we open to your love, your grace, and your tenderness in these days. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you soon. And now I have to go turn off the video. Bye.